Shannon Underwood is a University of Washington graduate and member of the Runstead Advisory Board. Shannon practiced law for three years before making her career change into commercial real estate development. She and her husband, David, are the owners of Underwood Gartland Development. Hello, Shannon. Thanks for coming on with us today. Hi, Mom. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Jeff. Sean, I'm delighted to be here. I've got some scintilla of knowledge that I hope I can pass on. <laughs> Excellent. Well, so help us to understand your background and how you connected with the uh, Runstead Department of Real Estate. Well, uh, like any natural person, I'm a graduate of the University of Washington. And after school, I went to EF Hutton. I became a stockbroker, did that for a couple of years. Then I went to law school where I was not what you would call the outstanding student. I was in the top half of the class. I went to work for a real estate firm. The firm busted up after three years and I went out on my own. And in that firm, I was doing real estate law. So uh, then I had an opportunity to take over property management portfolio from my uh, dad and brother-in-law. And that's how I got my start. And that was back in 1993. Not very long after that, I uh, joined my father and brother-in-law in a our first development, a second development, and then David Gartland, my husband, and I went out on our own, and that's what we've been doing. We've been working together then since 1997. Great. So then your connection with the uh, Runstead department, how did that start out? Well, uh, as far as Runstead, I was doing a presentation uh, for a women's group, and I was sitting next to Ann Lawler, who was president at the time, and she said, do, do you want to be on this board? And I didn't know about it, so I asked the natural question, which was, how long is that going to take, and, you know, what's the commitment? And uh, so I joined the board. I was really enjoying it, and it didn't take very long to the point where I got to the chair. So now I've uh, just been appointed the vice chair and then the chair next year. So curse Ann Lawler. It's much more time than she promised. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to, to your company. You found it. Share with us more about what it is you do when you're not on the board and doing those duties. Well, when I'm not on the board, I like doing a lot of physical things. So uh, we live out here in Bellevue. It's not terribly remote, but uh, we've got chickens out here and quite a bit of gardening. So I like digging holes. I like doing the chicken stuff. I like all kinds of sports. So skiing, I try to run most days in the woods. I basically like being outside. Uh, Shawnee and I like scuba diving together. And, uh, you know, some travel, and we do quite a bit of boating during the summer and in the off season of the winter as well. Great. And, and so for, for work, I've seen some photos that I know you're going to share some of your past projects. Tell us about the work that you do. Well, we are industrial developers. So we did build an office building once, and it was quite pretty. It's uh, this Sweeney Conrad building that we built in 2000. So I'll let you admire what we could have been doing this whole time, but that was not really our forte. So I'll, I'll show you what our buildings sort of often look like. So there's a building we built in 1999 called uh, Under Gartland 12, and that's kind of illustrative of how our types of buildings look, they're rectangles. But I also wanted to show you something that really ugly that we started with because we've started working on more terrifying parcels. So this one that is noted as uh, Everett One is a picture of a mine that we bought right after the downturn when deep, uh, dirt was still a little bit cheap. And you can see by that picture that this is just a horrible looking piece of property. And it was terrifying to us as well. We tried to market that property for a while and then we got smart after not very long and we did all the dirt work on it and then we waited out the rest of that particular downturn and built ahead and that turned out to be really great because we were a couple of years ahead of our competitors. 
So for a picture of what that ended up looking like at the end, just a partial, I've got the uh, court exterior there. And uh, so it was a real pretty sight. Um, as far as another one, one illustrative building is uh, our Underwood Gartland uh, 63, and that has FedEx in it. So that again was part of this mine. So the part of what we do, the scary part is all of the dirt work. So I've showed you, you know, pictures of us grading the site and then putting in the storm pond. And these are when these dirts and these mines particularly because a lot of it is fill dirt are, are really, really awful looking. And this is when we're in the most danger because we don't know exactly what we're gonna find in there. We hope it's good, but I know our neighbor found a buried pickup truck when he was doing part of the mine. So it can't be bad, you know, it can be kind of bad. So then I've showed the uh, 63 slab pour. Once we get the slab poured, we're safe. There's going to be marketing problems, but we've probably thought about those. But the dirt is our most uh, our most challenging thing on that. So those are kind of how the uh, project progresses. I showed you one more thing, which is the um, a 63 grading mistake. And I wanted just to illustrate that you have to be paying attention to these projects all the time. So on this one, our slope was too steep. And had I not been so lazy and not going to several slight site meetings, which really was, was a mistake, I would have seen that. I would have seen it because I have enough experience, but I wasn't showing up. So I'm never going to do that again uh, because when you're independent developers like we are, you have to watch your projects every second of the time and you I, all our consultants are great and I trust them all, but you have to depend on yourself because you're the guy who's going to lose your house at the end. Great. Well, first of all, I think we discussed that we're not going to call me Shawnee in professional settings anymore. So I want to remind you of that. Uh, secondly, in all my vanity, I was looking up an article from you in the Future Sound Business Journal back in 1999. And you said you had just bought in, uh, a property in Woodville, UG140, I think, one of your first projects. He said, I don't know how far outside of Woodenville we'll ever go, but now we're in Everett. But now, you know, even Everett's kind of locked up. Do you see the market expanding further than that? Or at some point, does it stop going north? What's your opinion there? Well, Sean, uh, that is a good question. And um, as you don't recall, because you were so little at that time, our kids were really little. And we just kept having kids throughout the development process. And so we didn't want to go too far away. We didn't want to spend all of our time driving up to the site because like I said, you have to pay attention to them. But then, yeah, we did make the big jump to Maltby and then Everett, we really had to, we really had to goad ourselves up there. So I know that all of my competitors are going up to, uh, are going up to past Smoky Point, which we looked at years ago, or, you know, they go south all the way, you know, past Lacey and out to Chehalis. As far as north and how far we go, and we've looked at Marysville and we've looked at Arlington, but you know, we're infill developers. Uh, we're usually not out there making, making the market. That's not really appropriate for us. So at this point, I would be more inclined to go south uh, so I could see things that would serve our northern tenant base as the uh, traffic problems are you know, more and more severe. So I tend to look that way. The North stuff is obviously a great market for a lot of people, but at present, I don't think that David and I will, will go up that far. We spent a lot of time looking at stuff up there, but it's, uh, the rents are a little lower and the costs are the same. So work that how you do. Gotcha. Well, transitioning back to your role on the board, I know that you chair the student experience committee. I thought maybe you could talk about that and some of the, the actions you're looking to take there. Well, the Student Experience Committee is a new committee, which I got tasked with, and I was glad to take it on because I, I really like working with the students. I think that's super fun. So uh, we kicked it around in our committee for a while to figure out what were the things that the students needed. I talked to a number of the alumni and when what it boiled down to and what was achievable in the beginning, because, you know, you start incrementally and you move on was that we needed to uh, greatly strengthen the mentorship program and the internship programs. 
So I've been meeting with the committee and the executive board, and uh, then I met with the dean and uh, Sophia as well to kind of flesh out how that is going to work. And my committee members have been pretty helpful, especially Jeff Lyon. I just ended up doing everything he said. So uh, with such a large class anticipated for next year, and it really is huge, uh, we're seeking then to have a matching period in October after we get some sense of the, uh, well, we can't really get a sense of the students because they start at the end of September but to match them up with, uh, with Runstead advisory board member firms uh, based on the student's interest. And then we'll have meetings, either formal or informal, uh, you know, no more than twice a quarter to get that relationship going. And to be clear, this isn't something where the student would be seeking a job because that's not what mentorships are about. It's it's advice on career paths and insight into uh, what that firm does. And maybe they'll meet for coffee. Maybe they'll go around to site meetings. Maybe they'll share budgeting. So we're fleshing it out. And I'm supposed to work with uh, one of the UW staff people all summer long to really figure out how that's going to go. With the internships, we were trying to modify that to make it uh, more accessible for the films while we're in this sort of pandemic moving into post pandemic, I uh, hope period, so that we could have, maybe there would be internship opportunities that were just two to four weeks, maybe they would be the traditional all summer. So we spent a lot of time on the committee. And Will Jockey was really super helpful on that trying to figure out more things that the MSRE students could could help with depending on what classes they've taken you know do they need the, them to have the Argus training or do they say uh, to help us with site analysis we want you to have taken xyz classes so as it stands we'll be looking of course there's always the traditional way that internship programs come in and that's not about this but we're trying to have the board supplement those uh, so there will be more opportunities for the students. Did I answer your question, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was perfect. I know in uh, in your past life you were a president of NAOP, and uh, you know you've been really involved networking throughout your career. It's one of the I think, strongest professional points that you have. Um, can you just speak a little bit about how you approach that, and you know how you find value in that, and kind of the way you go about it? Yes, I can because I've thought about it a lot. Um, so. I made, I did networking when I was a lawyer as well, but, but now it's different. So I joined, because NAOP's illustrative. I joined NAOP in uh, 1996, I think. So I immediately joined a committee and I went to all the meetings where I didn't know anybody. And that was, you know, that's torture. Uh, but Eventually, I kept working on that committee. I went on the board. And as you know, I was uh, president in 2006. Then I was on the inter or the uh, national board for, for two or three years. So now, as I've gotten so far away from that period of time, I used to know many, many, many of the people in the room. Well, the thing about networking is, you know, your peers will age out and you have to keep doing it all the time. So my rule of thumb, I have two. When I go to a breakfast meeting, I make sure I meet four people that I didn't know before. And I sit with people I don't know. I just sit down anywhere and I start from there. And I look, usually I'll look for someone who's alone because that's helpful, especially if you're the guy standing alone. Otherwise I bust into conversations, which sometimes is not appreciated, but there you go. Uh, the other thing is in any organization I join, I try to make myself useful. So I was on the uh, board of my high school. And so I started on a committee and went up to the board and then, you know, with the run stat. So I try to keep them limited, but to really provide value and to be active because it's no use being the guy who shows up and doesn't do anything. Because remember, people are thinking about you as the whole person. So I hope by now that when they think about me or they, my company, they know that I will work and I'll follow through and do what I'll say. So I'm just trying to present myself. 
Perfect. Hey, uh, do you want to tell us about maybe, um, you know, uh, a book or a hobby or something that you did that kind of facilitated or helped your professional career and where it took you? You know, I got to admit, I have an unexamined life. I, uh, so I don't read business books. I don't read self-help books. I don't read diet books. God help you. I didn't read any uh, child rearing books. So I don't <laughs> do that. But what I do read a lot of is I read a lot of news. I read a lot of local news and I read a lot of national news and the Puget Sound Business Journal and the Daily Journal of Commerce and The Economist. And through that, uh, all those things, I'm trying to keep tabs in case there are mentions of my tenants or ideas I have about what my tenants might need or what I might be thinking of. I look for industry trends, uh, you know, because I'm sort of an old dog to make sure that we are keeping up to date with what our buildings should be doing. Should we be doing a different kind of roof or a different kind of, I remember when they started having super flat slabs or, uh, you know, what are my joys going to look like? Are there different materials? What are loading docks doing? How's that changing? Do I have to do what they're doing in Chicago? No, not yet, but I probably at least have to do what they're doing in, you know, the, the North places. So that's what I spend a lot of time reading. Other than that, I read a tremendous amount. And uh, I read a lot of nonfiction, which I like. I just read the history of concrete, which sounds boring read the history of shipping, sounded boring, but they were really good. I read a lot of foreign detective novels. I read a lot of literature from the 1940s because it's relaxing. Uh, so yeah, quite a bit of reading for me. Now Great. you haven't really asked a lot about the chickens, but I like those too. We'll, we'll give you a chance at the end to answer all the chicken questions, uh, but I got one more for you. Um, in your opinion, uh, being a or sorry, being a small infill developer, you know it's it's a really tough to get started. It's it's that beginning project to get yourself off the ground, and each one after that, in theory, would come easier. You know, how did you make the leap? What was the transition like? And you know, how scary was that? Well, Sean, I am glad that you had an opportunity to graduate college because I spent your college fund twice and our retirement funds and maxed out the credit cards and had lines of credit, which are terrifying because lines of credit can be called at any time. Uh, so you gotta recognize that anytime the bank feels insecure. And you know we all feel insecure when we have a bad, bad hair day or something like that. So that was it, it was looking at the numbers and uh, you know, if you do a project in theory, you've looked at, you know, 25 before that and hopefully only had to pay for the due diligence on one so it was looking at a lot of different projects i had my name to rely upon because you know your grandpa had been successful and so that was helpful for us um and i know that had we gotten in trouble he probably wouldn't have let us go to the alms house so that was how we started was by leveraging everything. And since then we've worked steadily to pull that leverage down. Um, an example of that and where you have to be really careful is, you know, our interest rates are at a historic rate now, but when we're doing our pro formas and work, we have to make sure that if the time comes to refinance in 10 years, we're gonna be able to get out of there okay if the interest rates are nine and a half percent or something like that. So we gotta keep our leverage low. And that's that's gonna be troubling when everybody comes up to refinance in a period like this. So you really have to be conservative. So I answered a whole bunch of different questions there. Absolutely. So if our audience wants to connect with you, what's a good, what's a good way to get in touch? It would be best to use my email, which is Shannon at ug deb.com. That is the best way because I forget to answer my cell phone or to indeed to look at the messages. But I will always answer my phone if I'm home. And that number is 425 881 2113. I work at home, uh, but I'll always listen to those messages. It might be as, not as quick as you would think, but, but I do do that. Um, I won't notice emails sent via my website. I wish I did, but I, I won't. I know myself. I, here's your opportunity to talk anything about the chickens that you want. 
Well, okay, I've got eight chickens now and they're laying extremely well. <laughs> and uh, two of them are really dependent. And so when I go out to do the gardening or dig holes or whatever, I always let the chickens out. I got to watch them and be out there with them on account of the coyotes. But two of them uh, who are both named berries, although berry, although they're females, follow me around. So whenever I'm planting, they're standing right next to me. And I don't know why, but um, I think that's fun that the chickens are dependent. That's great. Hey, Jeff, do you got anything else? No, I just want to say, well, first, uh, thanks for uh, letting us know on Shawnee. Uh, we can continue with the alumni events to, uh, to, to call them out by that. But I, I want to say, you know, thanks for your efforts within the department. And uh, you've obviously mentored Sean well, because I've been in his cohort and graduated with him. But uh, he's the first person to come up, say hello at, at events, turn around in class when you got the answer right, give you a fist bump. So your mentorship started at home first and we were the beneficiary of, uh, of Sean and, and our cohort. So thanks for all you do for the department and, uh, and beyond. Great, thanks guys. And Shawnee, I am taking, oh, I did it again, the credit for uh, all of that, for your natural personality being a result of my training. So yes, right. it was all me. Thank you, Jeff. Yep, meet, meet four people and sit with who you don't know. Thanks for coming on, Mom. All right, we'll see you again, boys.